Okay, here debaters, um, uh, we're again at this, and today we switch sides. MAK will be the proposition uh, that, uh, no, I'm sorry, MSYCU uh, will be the proposition that defending Darwinism, you guys will be opposing uh, Darwinism. So, all the rules, am, am I right? No? I'm sorry, I'm getting old. They are therefore Darwinism you're against. Okay. Yeah. And the rule No, no, we're against Darwinism. <laughs> sorry, maybe we should cut this. Okay. Again, all the rules apply. Okay? So I wish every speaker the best. Okay. And uh, let the uh, show begin. First, a proposition constructed. Hello everyone and good morning. My name is Genevieve and as me and my fellow evolutionists have researched thoroughly, we were able to find an overwhelming amount of evidence proving evolution to be true. Before my teammates begin explaining their arguments, I will briefly introduce them beforehand to deliver the main points for you all. First, we as evolutionists believe that we have evolved over time and that we did not look like what we do now compared to in the past. Also that the origin of life had to descend from a common ancestor billions of years ago for all living organisms on Earth. To back this up, there is substantial evidence by carbon dating fossils, which are found by archaeologists, <coughs> studying the age of Earth, genetics and organisms, and studying transitional forms. I want to s say that the reason why evolutionists and creationists have had an ongoing standoff is because of the similar anatomy evidence we both find to prove each other our own arguments. Though I'm here to say that we evolutionists have prepared to break this standoff with solid information that confirmed that the creationist side um, provides unsubstantial evidence to prove their statements to be false. Thank you for your time and attentiveness. Hi, good morning, I'm Sky, and I think evolution is fiction. So, uh, as we all know, the evolution is based on the natural selection, and natural selection is based on the DNA. So, when we talk about the evolution, we must talk about the DNA and the origin of life. And I, in my opinion, the DNA and RNA are impossible to appear on the original Earth, so not to mention the evolution. And first, although um, maybe now we believe that the RNA is the first to appear, but its formation conditions are extremely harsh and it's difficult to synthesize in the laboratory and it's more difficult to synthesize under the truly condition. So, and it's, the RNA is um, inherently unstable. So, even if we can synthesize the RNA, we are still far from having the RNA molecules that catalyze, fully catalyze the replication of its own sequence. And if it cannot replication and translation, the information of RNA are mineralized. However, the translation and transcription of a um, gene or DNA and RNA are extremely conflicted. So every part of that depends on all the other parts, uh, such as the transcription of RNA requires many DNA and many kinds of proteins. So it's too difficult to imagine on the original Earth is with, with a very terrible environment. How can RNA make decisions and use method to manufacture many proteins and many RNA and DNA molecules to help with the transcription? So I think DNA and RNA are, are impossible to appear on the original Earth. And we strongly believe that uh, evolution is fiction. Thank you. Good morning, guys. I'm CK. Evolution is evolution is absolutely random, and there is no free will to explain. Evolution has always been an unconfirmed hypothesis, and at the same time, more and more scientists are questioning it. This hypothesis will be obsessed by many people because we are all tied by textbooks. This. This may be why scientists can't find the second hypothesis. For this reason, evolution has become the only choice for biologists, regardless how many 
uh, uh, unreasonable phenomena as such as uh, my partner say DNA and RNA are almost impossible to to pierce on the original Earth. Over the years, uh, evolution has been used by many biologists in their research. Uh, theories, including taxonomy, ecologic, those are based on evolution. This has also case many people hold a concept. The theories of evolution is impossible, can be wrong. Uh, uh, when evolution is overformed, all research theories it will be overformed. This is why many people come to faith. Uh, can't evade this wrong problem. Uh, I mean, is uh, Darwin he set up a boss in your mind? At the same time, the Bible records one is one of the reasons why I don't support evolution. The Bible point out that God creates everything, first with fish and bird, then with animal or name, and finally with human. Those uh, both are random and not are ordered. The Bible is widely with because it is not just a religion. Many of the records are uh, uh, ancient historical material uh, with research value. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Harrison. I would like to stake two supporting points for the evolutionist side. My two points are the age of the Earth and the origin of life. We believe that the age of the Earth is four billion years old, and we can show evidence by carbon dating. Creationists will try to prove us wrong by saying the Bible says that the Earth is only 6,000 years old, and they also try to use evidence from the story of the Noah's Ark and the flood. They, said, they say that the flood accelerated the aging of the strata to make it look older than it actually is. But the thing is, radiometric dating and fossil remains such as prehistoric human skulls, teeth, that date back more than 6,000 year, years ago help us prove this wrong. Also, fossils like the megatherium support evolution because it is closely resembles to like a sloth. My second point is that the earliest signs of life were found in Greenland, 3.7, they were found in Greenland in metasedimentary rocks 3.7 billion years ago. They found stromalite fossils to prove that. This ties in with my first point because it helps prove that Earth was created more than 6,000 years ago. Creationists try to oppose this with evidence by showing that the Bible says that the Earth was created only 6,000 years and the first origins, were li first origins of life were in Genesis 1. So in conclusion, our team believes that evolution is valid. Thank you for listening. Good morning, everyone. My name is Abraham, and today I'll be talking about the evidences of evolution. Now, a lot of people believe that the second law of thermodynamics, what does it say? It says that things go from order to disorder. Unfortunately, that is half true and half not true. The second part of the second law of thermodynamics says things go from order to disorder in an isolated place. Now, let me give you an example. This is a water bottle, right? Is this in isolation? Is the water in the water bottle in isolation? It's not. It's not in isolation because the heat that is generated by my hand is going through the water, affecting the temperature and the energy of the water. Now let's look outside. We see the rays of the sun shining through Earth. We see meteors striking on Earth. Is Earth an isolated place? No, it's not. Therefore, Earth, the things on Earth, can go from disorder to order. Now let me talk about the age of the Earth. A lot of people believe that the Grand Canyon, the only two ways to form the Grand Canyon is the Colorado River magically flowing upwards and cutting through the Grand Canyon creates such a miraculous Grand Canyon or a flood caused it, the Noah's flood that created the Grand Canyon. Unfortunately, you're wrong. The Colorado River, how scientists define the creation of Col uh, the Grand Canyon is that there was a flat layer, the Colorado River flowed through it, and then because of the movement of the tectonic plates, there was a slight uplift. There was a slight uplift, and then the Colorado River cut through it, and this uplift continued and created the Grand Canyon. And where do we see evidence of, evidences of that? Well, within two layers of the Grand Canyon, we see limestone. How is limestone created? By shallow waters, shallow marine, warm shallow marine waters. 
That is the only way. Oh, uh, another way for limestone to be created is by fossils, but obviously we don't see that many fossils in the Grand Canyon to create such a large and vast piece of limestone. So the only other way is warm, marine, shallow waters. And you're not gonna tell me the flood came in and then stopped for a while and there was shallow water and then the flood came in again and then it stopped again. No, that, that, no, that, that just does not correspond with the Bible. So therefore, the Grand Canyon is created by a long, long period of time with the Colorado River, not flowing magically upwards, but cutting through it while the tectonic plates lifted it upwards a little, little by little. Thank you for listening to my speech. Greetings, my name is Timmy, and today I'm going to support our team life why we think evolution is efficient. <coughs> Let's talk about the Cambrian explosion. The Cambrian explosion refers to the appearance in the fossil record of most major animal body plants about 543 million years ago. At the time of Charles Darwin, no fossils were found and were known to exist below the Cambrian layer. The Cambrian fossils seem to explode from nowhere. Well, after over a century and a half of research, more and more fossils have been found throughout the Cambrian. We now know that every major group of organisms, including vertebrates, exist at the time this layer will deposit. This means every major body plant existed before the Cambrian. And these creatures are amazingly different from one another and many, like trilobites, are highly complex. They have common eyes that are among the most sophisticated and complex vision system of any creatures that have ever lived. Where did all these creatures come from? Well, Darwin thought the ancestors of these creatures were buried in the layers that were already away before the Cambrian layers were deposited. This missing layer were eventually found, and the creatures found in them cannot be their ancestors to the creatures in the Cambrian layers. Researchers also found fossils in the Precambrian layers, the rock layers below the Cambrian. These organisms are incredibly different from Cambrian creatures. They can't be their ancestor either, so the ancestor of the Cambrian creatures has yet to be found. This is a huge problem. It means that the ancestor of all the major animal body groups simply cannot be found. If we can find the ancestor of the major animal body groups, why should we assume evolution actually happened? The Cambrian, Cambrian explosion really casts a huge shadow of doubt on the entire evolutionary story. Thank you. Okay, so, hello, good morning. My name is Gene, and as Timmy mentioned, uh, the ge geology conditions serve uh, uh, some evidence of uh, transition fossil. Uh, and that's the key to the origin of species. Even if uh, the, or, uh, the or organism itself and its properties wasn't such appropriate to, to leave some fossil birds, like uh, our opponent just said in uh, Grand Canyon, there's just not, not so much fossils. But uh, there's a period right before Cambrian, and it's called uh, Idiacurian. And it provides uh, such huge amounts of fossils, and even named a fauna. It, it means it's very complete. Okay, and <clears throat> it doesn't make sense that uh, both Idiocaran and Cambrian they provide us such huge amount of fossils, but there's a gap between them. So I think fossil evidence should be continuous. So uh, the origin of species just cannot explain it. There are two explosions and there are extinction between. Okay, and I want to ask a question about uh, our opponent. I just forget his name. Uh, I think a flop between two layers of uh, warm marine water is possible because it, we we all know that sea level will change, and like uh, even hundreds of meters. Uh, just right be be between mainland and Taiwan. No? The sea level will change. So I think it's possible. Yeah. So that's my opinion. Thank you.
third is composition and construction. Good morning, everyone. My name is Grace, and today I'll be sharing my two um, supporting points for the evolutionist side. So my first point is that there are evidences from transitional forms. Scientists have found several transitional forms of whales with legs, both capable and incapable of movement. If you watch dolphins or whales swim, you'll notice that they are different from other fishes. Fishes have vertical fins that move side to side, while dolphins and whales have fins that move up and down. Um, this is because whales evolved from a walking land mammal, so their backbones naturally move up and down. You can easily see this, see this when you watch a dog running. Its vertebral column undulates up and down in a wave when they run, and whales do the same thing when they swim. And otters and beavers are mammals that can swim underwater. Like them, whales can't breathe underwater but they have a special respiratory system that can help them store enough oxygen when they submerge into the water. Um, and even though whales are still mammals, they live in a completely different environment and they can't interbreed anymore. So they are a completely different <coughs> species now. And my second point is the homologous gene shows that species had common ancestors. Some species have homologous genes um, because they inherited it from a common ancestor. For example, humans, cows, chickens, and chimpanzees all have a gene that was present in their common ancestor. Scientists have used a gene that was present in their common ancestor and used a computer analysis to read evolution backward to reconstruct a large part of a genome of an 80 million year old mammal. This sh tiny shrew-like creature was the common ancestor of humans and other living um, creatures. Homologous structure provide evidence for common ancestry, like the tail of chimpanzees and our tailbone is the same. And they have the same form and same structure. So this show that we came from the same ancestor. Thank you for listening. Hello, my name is Karis, and today I'll be presenting two arguments for the evolutionist side. So for my first argument, it is that all different species diverged out time from the same common ancestor. And we can see this through molecular biology by comparing genetic material and genetic codes. And we can see ex an example of this is the, um, the codes used to translate um, nucleotide sequences into amino acid sequences because they're essentially the same, and also the fact that the proteins in all organisms are the same 20 set of amino acids. For my second argument, it is that all living things can be classified into species, genres, and families, and so on. And we can see this once again through molecular level by matching the faces and resemblance through um, molecular family trees. And also, I wanted to bring up the fact that we can observe and study evolution through um, fields and labs. And one of the most famous examples are the Harvard Technion <coughs> demo evolution on a plate experiment. And that um, through this experiment, we could see that evolution can, can be happening in bacteria. Therefore, um, through these arguments, I hope that we can, I can prove that evolution is a fact. Thank you. <coughs> Hello everyone, I am Henry. I believe this evolution is fiction. I intend to take fossil reconstruction as an example to explain evolution errors. How do I think evolution is fictitious? Because the fossil don't show gradually the evidence of evolution. In Precambrian, scientists discovered some unicellular microfossils in the rock formation. <coughs> they, they also found creatures show as coral or insects in sediments in the later Cambrian period. According to Darwin evolution, we know that creatures don't change dramatically in a short period of time. 
So nebulous fossil will preserve from unicellular to multicellular. However, during this time existed, we can find any fossil record, which also means that we have not we have no strong evidence to prove that the evolution is credible. <coughs> to sum up, we know that many life forms, both simple and complex, appear <coughs> appear together, and the lost animal appear in a sudden. <coughs> we should not only infer results from only some evidence, not to mention the first letter time which the creatures existed on the Earth was so long. <clears throat> if there is no favorable and continuous evidence of fossil records, it could, it could not convince us. By this evidence above, I dispute the conclusion that evolutionary biologists make about one species evolving into another. Thank you, everyone. This is my opinion of evolution. <laughs> Hello, I am Sen. As, as Henry mentioned, we know the important sort of Darwin's evolution is the great difference in biology is a, a, is a result of accumulation of tiny variation. In theory, we can find the number of transitional fossils in Precambrian based on the Cambrian transi uh, transitional fossil in. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> it's push. Unfortunately, we don't find any transitional fossil and even ancestor fossil in Precambrian. The time about billions of years of Precambrian is long enough to accumulate fossil, but we still lack the evidence of variation. For example, trilobite has complex structure like uh, exoskeleton and uh, compound eyes, but uh, how delayed evolve from simple to complicated structure. That's a question that we want to ask you. And talk about the fossil preservation. Some people think it wasn't suitable for the construction of fossil in Precambrian strata. However, an evolution scientist said, the sedimentary rock of Precambrian are similar to the sedimentary rocks containing fossil of Cambrian. They are obviously also suitable for preserving fossil, but we haven't found fossil in this rock. So uh, in conclusion, if the Darwin's evolution is true, it's unreasonable that there isn't any fossil evidence to prove in Precambrian. We need continuous fossil to know about evolution more. That's the reason why I think the Darwin's evolution is fiction. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Ethan, and I'll be ex arguing that evolution is a fact. I'll start by explaining how molecular biology can prove that we come from a common ancestor. So studies in DNA clearly show structural resemblance between a lot of animals. And most mammals have different four, not the four different nucleotides, but they're made from the same 21 amino acids. And they're, uh, and they're found to be very similar. And you can think of amino acids as the fundamental building blocks of life. They determine your function and your appearance. And this is why we are so similar to apes or other, or other species. And also, this supports, the life being uh, this supports life being created on random because scientists replicated the conditions of the original Earth when it just began. And throughout a few months, they have already created amino acids, which, like I have said, is a building box of life. And how come even though we see this experiment, we still say that life is created by a higher being or designer? We created the basic building blocks of life in just a short, in just a time span of a short few months. Imagine years, decades, centuries, or even more. There's almost a guarantee that under this pattern, life will be complex and functioning, per functioning perfectly like it is right now. And moving on to my second point. In early stages of development, there are rest uh, wait, in early stages of development, physical appearances share resemblance in mammals. Vestigial structures like gill slits, appendix, tailbone, they're all left over from evolution. And so throughout evolution, 
between the starting organism to the end. There are structures <coughs> and organs from the previous organism that is left over, and we cannot use those structures anymore. Hence the name vestigial structures. And why is it through all? Why is it that we have all this evidence, but we still believe that a higher being or a fairy tale god created us? We can choose to believe in evolution, a simple way that is under that can be understood by humans. And this is why I choose to believe in a logical explanation of life, evolution. Thank you. Okay, good morning, my name is Anne and I am part of the evolutionist side that affirms the existence of macroevolution and that there isn't a more logical argument for the diversity of life except evolution. And today I'll be explaining two fundamental evolutionary concepts which are adaptive radiation and anagenesis. So adaptive radiation is when climate and geogra geography change induces change upon the species living in specific areas. So when a group of organisms is isolated from each other, the mutations can cause genetics to diverge and through adaptation and the survival of the fittest, the environment different stresses will make the organisms to develop new characteristics. And this will eventually develop new species. And this is how cladogenesis appears. Cladogenesis is when a parent species splits into two species and forming a clade. So a new species, the new species that are formed by cladogenesis will not be able to produce offspring or they will only produce offspring that are sterile. And this proves that that new species are created since species are species are defined to be organisms that can interbreed. And now moving on to anagenesis. So anagenesis is the uniform transformation from one species to the other. So anagenesis is a type of continuous evolution. And it's a and it is when the entire species will uniformly evolve into a different species. So for it will be like the whole species A will eventually evolve into species B because of environmental reasons or some other reasons. And so hypothetic hypothetically, if the species A were still there, they will not be able to reproduce with species B or only produce sterile offspring. And anagenesis is actually pretty rare and there's an imperfect example that will explain this, which is the horse that has, which is the horse. So in the beginning, the horse started from a small animal with five toes and it's more like herbivore dog. And by that time it lived in jungles and where its toes were more useful. Okay, so, okay. So eventually it, it evolved into modern horses, okay. So to conclude, I have, I have presented two ways that evolution could work. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kenneth. Uh, in my opinion, I think the Darwin theory of evolution is a fiction because it can perfectly explain all the issue of evolution. We all know the natural selection is the main idea of a theory of evolution. But natural selection is one kind of microevolution. Microevolution refers to small evolutionary changes within, within a spe uh, species. Let's mean microevolution just focuses on change that occur at under the level of species. When the change only occurs at under the level of species, it can perfectly explain how the species turn into an other species. For example, the giraffe. You may know the giraffe has long necked and short necked before. Short necked couldn't get enough food and it adopt the environment. Only the long necked survive. The giraffe goes through the process of natural selection, but it's, it is still a same species. 
So natural selection only can explain the adaptation and the variation in one species, but can explain how the new species appear. That's why I think the uh, Darwin theory of evolution is efficient. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Benson, and I'm going to talk more about the microevolution and the macroevolution. As my teammate Kenny says, the, micro, the main point of the micro, microevolution is the small changes of the DNA will, will gradually make a difference in the same species. It's the same species. <coughs> and for example, scientists also proved it. For example, the nips of the finches on the Galapagos Islands. But in, in macroevolution, it says that the small changes of the DNA in a long time scale will, will let the creatures evolve to be a new species which is fitter to the environment. However, they cannot explain some fossil evidence, such as the sudden appearance of the fossils between Cambrian and the Cambrian. They cannot explain where all these fossils come from. And Exactly. The main point of the evolution is that the small changes of the DNA lead to the big difference between different species. But just as my teammate Henry and Sam says, there's no transitional fossils between Cambrian and Precambrian. So there's no, there's no small changes. So we think the evolution is a fiction. And the, the name of the microevolution, we can also call it, call it Micro variance or difference or special di species difference, and this is my opinion. Thank you. Okay, so good morning. My name is Diane, and today I'll be talking about how fossil. Um, like fossils in the three layer cake structure supports evolution. So basically, scientists determine, like, there's a three layer cake structure that scientists use to determine, um, like, to organize fossil, like, strata layers. So then, to understand this argument, you have to keep the law of superposition in mind, which is the lower layers of strata um, are older than higher layers of strata. So in the bottommost layer of the cake, you can find, which is the Paleozoic period, you can find fish, amphibians, and reptile fossils, but never mammals, dinosaurs, or birds. So that is that is so because during that period, they didn't evolve yet. So that's why in that period you can only find fish, amphibians, and reptiles. And interestingly, several types of plants were found, but no flowering plants were found in that period. So moving on to the second layer, which is the Mesozoic layer. Um, that layer is called the age of the dinosaurs because a lot of fossils of dinosaurs were found in that layer. So in that layer, flowering plants were found. So this could be explained because plants didn't flower before in the Paleozoic layer, but then when it got to the Mesozoic layer, it evolved and it evolved into flowering plants. So in that layer, very few mammals that we see today, like present mammals, were found because those were like the ancestors or like cousins of the present mammals. So in the Cenozoic layer, which is the newest <coughs> and top most layer, modern mammal fossils like cats, dogs, monkeys, and humans were found. So this whole thing could be explained by evolution because in the um, oldest layers, um, no mammals or other things were found. So as time goes on and as the fossil builds high and the stratus builds high, um, different, different species start to appear. And so this is why our team believes that fossil records like this could prove evolution. Thank you. So good morning, everybody, and my name is TJ, and today I'm going to be um, supporting the side of evolution. So my first point is that diverse groups of animals evolved from one or f 
one or a few common ancestors. And so one example is that birds evolved from the Archaeopteryx. And according to a paleontologist from the university, from a university in Switzerland, he said, the contour feathers in the wing and on sided tails of Archaeopteryx have an isometric shape, which is re usually related to higher aerodynamic performance. And so isometric means like the, the sides are not equal, and so they're like um, unbalanced. And so, and this has to do with um, creatures that fly up in, as it says, air, um, higher aerodynamic performance. And so this shows that birds were evolving, or yeah, birds were evolving from dinosaurs. And then, um, so that's one example. Another example is that um, the um, evolution of horses. And so the, in the past, horses were only, or the common ancestor of horses was the Eurohippus, and, he, and they were only 30 to 60 centimeters, and only weighed about 10 kg. And so you can imagine they were super small. But now if you look at the horses in today's world, they're taller than I am, and they're not 10 kg, and they're, they weigh much more. And then my second point is that animals had to evolve so that they can better survive and that th so that they can pass down their genes to their next generation. And an example of this is the giraffe and how they had to evolve and, um, so that they can survive because if they were just eating the food from down, like on the ground, there was way too many other animals and the comp competition was too high. And so the common ancestor of the giraffe is the Samotherium, which looks like an antelope and its neck its neck was only a meter long, which is only half of the length of the giraffe we know today. And, um, and so giving them longer necks allowed them to eat food on the top, which other animals could not get to. And so it helped them survive. And, then, and as Darwin said, only the fittest survive. And they, that's why they've survived. And then my second um, point for how animals have evolved is the pepper and moth. And so in it, like before, the pepper moths were all white. But and then in the Industrial Revolution in Europe, because of all the because of the pollution that was coming out, everything was um, all the surfaces were black. But the pepper moths, and so the pepper moths, sorry, they were able to be they were eaten by the predators because they were so easy to spot. So they had to evolve, and now they're um, not white, but they're black now. So they can adapt. So they've um, can so they can camouflage at the surface. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Jackie. I think evolution is fiction. We don't see the whole evolution directly, so we can be sure the, that the, the different species are evolving continuously. We can only determine the species indirectly by detecting the genes in fossils or, or observing the structures. Uh, gene makes species grow in different and makes species have reproductive isolation. However, the gene in fossils are all fragmented, so we have we can we cannot see the whole gene sequence in fossils, and that's why we cannot define the different kind of fossils are the same species or not. Um, natural selection always choose the advantages, uh, advantages features and gives up the disadvantages features. Those which can appear the advantages features will be saved, and those which those gene which cannot be. Um, will be given up. <coughs> but if natural selection is true, the gene makes people look handsome or pretty will be safe, but those, those make people look ugly may be given up. However, sadly, it seems didn't happen. People look horrible still insist, I'm a good example. <laughs> and uh, although I look ugly, I'm still homo sapien. And I have the same reproductive capacity as Takeshi Kaneshiro. <laughs> and both of us can have babies with Hanish, Hashi, <laughs> Hashimoto Kana. And, and both of us have the, the babies can have, can have the reproductive capacity. So we can, cannot define the species by observing the struggle of the fossils. That's my opinion. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, I'm Fogart, and I will use more examples to prove what Jackie said. And as Jackie says, those genes which can appear advantage feature will not always be 
uh, will not always be safe. And there are many factors that prevent natural selection uh, from eliminating unfavorable genotypes. First, recessive adults are usually not subject to natural selection in deep plot organism. And in, het <coughs> in heterozygous advantage, heterozygous have greater rep uh, reproductive success than hom homozygous. And frequency, frequency dependent selection is a type of balanced selection that's maintained two different phenotypes in a population. And in addition, when chromosome number change, it means it will make species get, ser get in serious disease or lose reproductive ability. And even the uh, character are spread, it's hard to make all the species gene you know, uh, whole species do have a little bit change. Thank you. Okay, good morning, fellow debaters and audience. My name is Sima Chen, and I'm from Morrison Academy, Kaohsiung. And today, I'm here to argue that evolution is a fact. So the first argument I'm going to be talking about is the structural evidence of evolution. The fossil record shows a gradual change of animals, and this is an undeniable fact. So the example I'm going to be giving is zebras. So the zebra has a complete record of what they look like in each period of time. In the current time, they are called equus, so this is their scientific name. 5 to 12 million years ago, they were called pliohippus. 12 to 16 million years ago, they were called merikippus. And before, before 16 million years ago, they were known as the mesohippus. So the zebra throughout time has been given different names and their fossils have changed in size and has a different head structure. This is an example of evolution because they are different species, however, they have a common ancestor. Next, your team has uh, frequently brought up arguments of the Precambrian explosion not proving evolution. However, paleontologists have found out that fossils during the Precambrian explosion, a lot of them were either destroyed by heat, pressure, erosion, or the fossils were too small or too soft to even have fossilized in the first place. That is the reason why there are so less examples of transitional species in the Cambrian and Precambrian layer. And next, I would like to give you a thought process of why you should believe in evolution. Over a span of 40 years, the average weight of Americans increased by 24 pounds, which is roughly 11 kilograms. The body structure of the people have become very different. They have a wider hip and a wider shoulder. In just 40 years, the body structures of Americans have changed drastically. And the, the opposite, opposition is trying to tell us that over billions of years, our body still hasn't changed, or we haven't evolved into newer species and there wasn't a big change. I believe this is completely illogical and evolution is still a fact. And I have a question in the end to ask you guys. If evolution was not true, then why are there so many species in the world? According to the Bible, Noah's Ark was not that big and it could not uh, carry millions of species on the ship. So this is completely like impossible to produce so many species except for the possibility of them evolving into new species. Thank you. Good morning, fellow debaters and audience. My name is Andre from Morrison Academy, Gaoshong. And today, I'm here to argue that evolution is a fact. 
Before I start stating my points, I would like to clarify that evolution is supported by over a century and a half of hard scientific evidence, while creation is only supported by biased religious texts. Evolution is so heavily supported that evolution's denial is the equivalent of denying that the Earth revolves around the sun. One particular point that the creationist team might bring up is the perfect design and the complexity of the human body. But studies have shown that the human body is actually not as perfect as the creationist team might have stated. A good designer would design a machine with the minimal am amount of defects and would design it to be simple. Furthermore, they would make sure that there is logic behind putting a component in a particular place. I would like to present several examples that would prove creationist beliefs to be false. The human eye is cited as the most perfect example of intelligent design, but from an engineering perspective, it's not perfect at all. In the human eye, there are nerves in front of the retina and where the optic nerve leaves the eye. There's a hole that creates a blind spot, so this is the reason why our eyes jiggle. We don't have any functional reasons for our eyes to be this way, except that historical, historically, the common ancestors of all vertebrates didn't contain a better retina. This directly counters the belief of the perfect design that, and God's divine purpose to humanity. The second example that I would like to bring up are vestigial structures that are contained in the human body. When the designer creates things, he would want his design to be clean so that there wouldn't be junk laying around in his design. But in the human body, there are plenty of structures that do not serve a purpose. For example, the human appendix, pelvis and snakes, and the tailbone. So how is the human body a perfect design when all of these flaws in imperfect design exist in our body? To conclude, the human body failed to prove the creationist team's arguments of perfect design, and the human body is just another result of evolution. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ryan, and uh, today I will talk about the probability of evolution. And uh, this is formula, uh, which calculates the probability of the evolution producing new species based on mutation probability. And, uh, and uh, this is n, the first uh, letter n. And uh, the n is mutation, the probability of an individual of a species has mutation. And the uh, second is C is compatible. And uh, this is the probability of the mutated gene is compatible with other genes. And uh, the next R is the is reproduction. And uh, after okay. <laughs> and uh, the individual can survive in survival com competition and then have a chance of reproduction. And uh, the next E is the, uh, the meaning of vertical evolution. And uh, this case has not been found so far, so some evolutionists estimate the E is 0 0.005. And uh, the last S is the mutated gene, the probability of the mutated gene is spent in the population. So, uh, we loosely estimate as is 0 0.1. So because of the formation, formation of new species requires the emergency, emergency of, of the series of new, of new species require uh, of new gene. And that is n, uh, we assume is 10, power index n is 10, and uh, so we can get the probability like this. 10 to the negative 100 power. So this is very close to zero. So I think it is impossible to evolve a new speech. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Hi everyone, I'm Sam, and uh, a different <laughs> with former one. And <coughs> I think the evolution theory is a fiction. We know that evolution is based on natural selection. However, if the gene does not mutate, natural selection is ineffective because there are no difference between each individual. Unfortunately, as my teammate Ryan said, the probability of mutation is very small. For instance, the probability of mutation of human gene is 2.5 times 10 to the minus 8. 
per each generation. I think it is impossible to evolve human beings. Moreover, some scientists even say that <coughs> the algorithms of mutation nowadays do not correspond to the real world. They think that the mutation in the real world is more complex and more crossover. <coughs> it means that we overestimate the probability of mutation by this formula, although it's very small, because we are not sure that each condition that affects mutation are under a linear system or not. <coughs> so the formula is simplified by scientists. <coughs> they suppose that each condition are independent so that we can estimate the probability of mutation by the simple mathematics. However, even though, even though we <coughs> Even though we simplify the, mutation, the probability of mutation by the simple formula, it's, the probability is still very small. And if we consider the more complex conditions, <coughs> the probability will smaller, undoubtedly. So generally speaking, it does not have a good explanation about how the creatures evolve by the tiny probability. So that, I think, evolution theory is a fiction. Thank you, everyone. Okay, hello everyone, I'm Clara, and today I'll be arguing that evolution is a fact. So my first argument will be directly going against what the speaker in the blue shirt said, because I'll be explaining how it is possible for species to evolve through macroevolution and establish new species. So an evidence that I have is the fact that fishes evolved into four-legged animals, and an example is a fish called Tiktaalik, which is a fish that lived around 375 millions of years ago. And it is considered as a, as a transitional form that shows the history of evolution as well as how one species can evolve into another species. And its fossils also show that it was halfway between a fish and a four-legged land animal. So Tiktaalik was still technically a fish because it was complete with gills and scales, but it also had um, unusual fins. So their fins had sturdy interior bones that were able to prop Tiktaalik up in shallow water, just like how four-legged animals behave. And also, they were able to use their limbs for support. And Tiktaaliks also had a larger hind appendage, which is different from other fishes. So from these fossil records, we can see how organisms were able to develop specialized features to be evolved into a new species. And my second argument will be addressing vestigial structures and I'll be explaining how they're leftovers of evolution. So vestigial structure is something that was important to an organism in the past for its survival, but now it's unnecessary due to evolution. So vestigial structures are crucial evidences of macroevolution because it shows how species were able to evolve through history. And for example, snakes have a vestigial lung, which is an evidence that snakes evolved from ancestors who had two lungs, and so this also proves that snakes derive from lizards, not the other way around. So the vestigial structures can also help us observe how previous animals were structured and what they needed for their survival. For example, humans don't need visible external tails anymore, <coughs> hopefully, and so, um, but our ancestors did, so our coccyx is a vestig vestigial structure that shows that. Overall, vestigial structures show how we evolved to become our current selves today, through macroevolution, and this is why I believe evolution is a fact. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Evan, and today I am arguing for the evolutionist side. <clears throat> I will give some argument that prove evolution to be a fact. I will be ta talking about how evolution can be proven by fossils. One example will be homologous structure. Homologous structure is structure that have fit similar form or function that appear that they descend from a common ancestor. One example would be monkeys and humans. Human hands and monkey parts are similar, which this can prove that we are related to monkey and we have a common ancestor. Another example will be cats, human, and bats. Cats, human, and bats all have similar hand structures. Some example will be humerus, radius, ulna, carpal, and the phalanges. 
These are some examples of homologous structure. Next, I will be talking about transitional forms. One evidence will be Archaeopteryx. This was an animal fossil that was found in Germany in 1861. It combines the trait of non-avian dinosaurs and birds. It is similar to non-avian dinosaurs because of their long feathered tails and small teeth. But also unlike the non-avian dinosaur, Archaeopteryx has flight feathers and wings, just like birds. According to Furby's a website, discovered, scientists discovered the furcula, which is a firm confirmation that Archaeopteryx is a transitional form between birds and dinosaurs, because they are the only two groups to have the, this anatomical features. Pizosiren portelli is another example of a transitional species. This species likely represents the transitional form of Serenia, which because they have maintained the general body plan of Serenia with heavy rib bones that could show that they lived part-time in water. And the difference between Pizosiren portelli and the Serenia is that they had four legs instead of flippers. So these fossils can be proved to us that there are transitional species. In conclusion, our team believes that macroevolution is valid. Thank you for listening. Okay, good morning everyone. My name is Phyllis and um, According to your evolution theory that you believe that after a, a species evolve into or mutate into a new species, there will be vestige organ that in their body. <sighs> Sorry. For example, appendix is uh, a, a, an organ that, that inside human body that you believe that is from the herbivore. We say we share the same ancestor from the herbivore animals. So the appendix is used for digest vegetables and plants. <laughs> and after herbivore animals uh, evolve or mutate into omnivores like humans, so we eat meats and vegetables, and you think we no longer need appendix for digest plants. So the appendix organ start to retrograde inside our body. But there has been contradiction in this theory. First is that, how do you know we no longer need empathic anymore? If we still consume best best <laughs> plants now, and we still need nutrition from the best, uh, vegetables and plants, how do we no longer need empathic for digest them anymore? And the second is that, um, in a new technology, we have already found appendix is have totally different function and different structure from those herbivore species. So, and the appendix organ inside our body, human's body, is used is part of immune system. So it have to, it has totally different function from those herbivore species that is used for digesting. And so the evidence cannot can no longer prove that humans have. Uh, this, uh, share the same uh, ancestor from the herbivore animals. So this is my opinion. Thank you. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is William. And my presentation will distinguish into two parts, construction and rebuttal. First is construction. In order to adapt to the different habitat, absolutely identical located <coughs> organs, tissue, muscle, and cadre will change their appearance. According to my partner's lines, a vegetable organs like appendix is considered to explain the process of evolution, which means species are forced to degenerate or intensify their partial body to ensure that they can survive in the evolution. Consequently, the only function of vegetable organ is the same with the original organs or the weakening functions. But having said that, we found some conflicting facts. For example, people and monkey are seen that they have same origin in the theory. If the theory is true, the tail could be a vestigial organ. But the fact is that people's cassocks are totally inward, which is upside to the creature having a tail. No matter how long, monkey's tail skeleton are always outward. Meaning, this is the paradox in the theory. 
So I consider evolution is a fake. And second is the main rebuttal part. For instance, you can see that uh, the Galapago birds have a lot of food resource, like the seed, the ne nectar, or <laughs> well, maybe you can change by the weight or anything. But anyway, we know the thick peaks would come soon nuts or seed, and the sharp one would come soon worm and insect. insect. Now, now, now the, however, their ancestors have identical peaks in long time ago. Therefore, we can say that evolution can only cause the difference, but not the entire part. In my, in my view, theory can explain microevolution, but not macroevolution. We can say that creatures have been involved into new types for hundreds of millions of years due to biological genetic diversity and mutation. However, it is too reluctantly for a species to transfer into another completely different types. Therefore, I think evolution is just a fantasy. And after all, I think that God doesn't play the dice. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, honorable judges and fellow opponents. My name is Max Lam from Morrison Academy, Kaohsiung. We as a team strongly believe in the motion evolution exists and already made some arguments about it. And now me as a last speaker will give the argument of ignoring genetic variation. Evolution is a theory that strongly relies on genetic variation. In the other way, you can even say that it is about genetic variation, in which is a term used to describe the DNA sequence in each of our genomes and determine our physical features such as our eye color, hair color, and even our face shapes. It's also a result of subtle differences in our DNA. The reason why we look different from our parents, or we look different from different races, such as American or Indians, it's all due to the influence of genetic variation. You can see how important genetic variation is to the whole field of biology, and also the possible origin of the Earth. However, you guys as creationists argue that the theory of evolution does not stand. By saying this, this is not only denying the fact that the concrete evidence of the origin of the world is backed up by fossil evidence and geological evidence is not valid, it's also denying the scientific fact that's been proven to be true a decades ago. Let me ask my opponent a hypothetical question. Will you disagree with the definition of gravity? Certainly not. Gravity is a natural phenomenon in which attract objects with mass and energy. You're not going to deny the fact that gravity exists, right? Or change its definition. But now what your creation side argues that evolution is not real. By saying this, this is actually also denying the fact that genetic variation is not real and also changing the definition of it. This also affects your perception on genetic variation. This is something that cannot be denied or cannot be proven to be false. Since this is what shaped the organism in this world today, by agreeing with creationism, it's not only denying evolution, but also denying the fact that ge genetic variation is not valid, or even worse, that it does not affect. In conclusion, what your team firmly believes in ignore, ignorantly ignores the fact that the existence of genetic variation and also doubted the diversity intricacy of this world with vague evidence, weak opposition. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Chen. Let me summarize our team's view. We absolutely think the evolution is fiction. First, the evolution cannot explain the origin of life. Second, Cambrian explosion. There are not amounts of transition fossil before Cambrian explosion. So the evolution cannot explain this event. Third, microevolution. According to the evolution, the natural selection is one kind of microevolution because the microevolution occurs at a level under the species. It cannot explain how a species turns into new species perfectly. Fourth, gene. 
The important view to prove the evolution is fossil, but fossil cannot prove the continuous change of gene sequence. Fifth, the range of variation of a species is limited. Probability of mutation is too small. It is between 1 in 10,000 to 1 in billion. The mutation also comes along with defect and death. The probability of a species not only mutated to new species but also survives is too small to occur. Six, vestigial organ. According to the organ called appendix, in herbivore and human has different function. This contradiction makes the evolution is fiction. Finally, there are many contradictions that the evolution cannot explain. So we think that the evolution is not perfect and is even not true. Thanks for listening. The opposition submitted the following argument. First, the evolution Hello everyone, my name is Penn. Evolution is a theory that is not regular or even fragmented. It believes that mutation can produce many new creatures of all kinds, but it cannot completely explain why the number of chromosomes can be changed by mutation. It believes that evolu uh, evolution is continu continuous process, but there is no complete evidence to prove it continuity. Because we barely found intermediate spe species unable to support, support the re rationality of the entire evolution theory. It believes that biological ev evolution is small to large, accumulating a lot of small change, and finally make a huge change. Uh, but we also found that Organism, uh, usually, organisms usually cannot produce new varieties through genetic vari variation. The probability of mutation is too small, make it difficult for us to believe that the species have e has evolved by chance. The origin of the species described, described by evolution is even more difficult to explain how complex life is produced. If, the, if all the diffi uh, difficult procedures, they are interpreted as, as accidental, I think this is a less regular theory. Thank you. Now we come to the uh, structured part of the debate. Now the floor is open uh, to challenges. Okay, so I remember what my opponent said about the probability of evolution occurring. Which one? So, huh? Which one? I remember it's. You remember the face, the name. Yes. Them. The, the, yeah, the, the one in the front. Yes. Yeah, Ryan and Sam. Okay, they say about the probability of evolution occurring, which is extremely low. So. Let me ask you guys a question. What is the probability of one human surviving two nuclear bomb crashes? Both in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. What is the probability of one human surviving both nuclear Armageddon? It's extremely low, right? But guess what? It happened, it occurred. So as long as probability, as long as probability is not zero, there will always be a chance that occur in this world. So this also proved evolution to be possible since the probability of evolution is not actually zero. There's actually a chance of it that actually going to appear. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I, I, think, I, think, I think it's not scientific because, 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 because you, are, you are not using the evidence that explains the low probability can cause the mutation. You only say the probability is not equal to zero and so that it will happen. But it's not scientific. You have this, you have to you have to have the enough evidence to show to convince us that the low, although the probability is very low, it still have the it still have the chance to 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 mutate to mutation to mutate. Yes, thanks. <coughs> Okay, uh, 
and Diana, yeah, I have a, yeah. Um, we know the layer always up and down, so there are many unconformity layer. So we just say the fossil in the layer, but how can you prove the, uh, the, the correlation between the fossil and the layer? So, yeah, do you know? <laughs> The, the correlation. Okay. Well, for the rebuttal, I would like to say two things. First, I'm going to back up Matt about uh, there's no scientific. Abraham, right? Yes, I'm Abraham. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, uh, you said that there was no scientific evidence for stuff like that, but um, I, I want to give you a probability, and that is that you. Any, any one of you, you, particularly you, being born is 1 over 10 to the power of 2,690,000. Yes, that is the probability. Without calculating the accidents that may happen to your ancestors before they actually reproduce you, all right? So that is obviously way more, uh, way, way smaller than 1 over 10 to the power of 100, all right? And um, I would like to ask uh, the fourth speaker, Jean. Yes, Jean. Uh, may you please repeat your two questions that you asked me on stage? Uh, I think that it's possible that the sea level change can make the Grand Canyon. Because you said there are a flood layer between two uh, seawater layers. I think it's possible because the uh, sea will rise and go back and rise. Wait, 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 wait. Reach, uh, so, wait, wait, so, so, you're saying, so you're saying that, um, yeah, so you're saying that the sea levels rise and created the Grand Canyon? Yeah, I, I think it's possible. Uh, you think it's possible, right? Um, you're, you're unfortunately wrong. Um, according, 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 yes, yes, yes. Um, according to, uh, I think you got this theory somewhere from Hovind. Yes, I think that's his name. Uh, he's, he's uh, the Hovind theory, yes. He states that a flood or like uh, sea levels rising and stuff like that will create a multiple clear layers of the Grand Canyon. And unfortunately, that is completely rejected by every scientist, even young creationist scientists. Um, the Hovind theory, uh, if you actually do it, you add red clay, sand, dirt, and all of that stuff into a glass tank of water, you stir it up, and what you see is not five, not four, not three, not two, but one layer, a gradient layer. You only see one layer. According to the Grand Canyon, we see multiple layers. Yes, and thank you. Wait, but if you come to our school at National Senior <laughs> University, we're on a mountain, uh, there, there's a zoo. If you go to the top of the mountain, you'll see coral reef. You know? There's coral reef because, uh, like, uh, maybe hundreds of thousands of years, there are seas. And where, where the schools are emerged under the seawater. Yeah, there are coral reefs. Uh, I think it's not, not or organism, it's maybe it's fossil. Uh, yes. yeah. Do you see yeah. specific layers on the. Oh, it's not there, it's just a rock, and there are many yeah, coral reefs. Exactly what I'm saying. The rock is well, no. <laughs> I'm sorry. I would like to answer her question. So then you're asking about the correlation between the fossil and then the layers, right? But if the layer is lower, then that means it's older, according to the according to the law of superposition. It is. Okay, she's right. Law of superposition says that older layers are uh, are older beneath the younger layers. But then, like different natural things could happen, like earthquakes. It could like flip, like tectonic plates, and like it would flip. <laughs> but then, like. It's still in that layer, so then, like in the, the stratus people consider, it's in like actual order, so then the fossils in the older layers are older. Thank you. Actually, it's not that simple, because the fossils in the layer might not be deposited at the same time. And so it has to do with the uh, dating methods and also determining if that fossil is in the situ. So, so, so it's more about um, Go ahead, Benson. 
Hello, I'm Benson, and I'm going to report someone、uh, quiz. And、uh, sorry, I don't remember your name. You said <laughs> you said that. You remember the face? Grace. 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 You said that the <coughs> the same complex same structure of the bonds may you you can you can suggest that they have the same access to bonds. This should be on premise that the evolution is the truth. If the 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 evolution is not the truth, you cannot say they have the same ancestor because they they can just the just the two different species and they involve into in into the bird that's the bond structures of the cats, humans, and the birds. They they can they can be a,、uh, totally a different species and they they. You know, it just is. <laughs> so you cannot use the evolution to prove the evolution. And this is my opinion. Thank you. Okay. So for raising the next piece of objection to, okay, you want to respond? Go ahead. Is it okay? Yeah. So what's your question? <laughs> 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 We want to see the evidence. When, how, and why to lay, to lay, to lay separated into different species. Where is the fossil? Where is the transition fossils? When and how? So since we're on the、um, topic of circular logic, so I remember the second speaker, I think CK or something. CK. Yeah,、uh, sorry, sorry about that. I I cannot really remember. And、um, I think she's she said that、uh, because evolution was written in like、uh, so many textbooks that all of us <coughs> think evolution is true, and then according to the Bible.、Uh, Creation is true because the Bible is God's word, and so that's how it's true. But then, isn't it kind of like circular logic as well? Like, if the Bible is true because it's the Bible is true because、uh, if creation is true because it's proved by the Bible, the Bible is true because it's proved by、um, it's proved by it because God's word is true. But then. However,、um, you didn't really explain how it's true, so I don't understand. Okay, CK. Now you're defending the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, my point is not the Bible is true or not true. My point is, if we are the scientists, we can't、uh, in 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 the history. If we are the scientists, we can't just want what is. I want and I believe this. This is my point.、Uh, but I'm not、uh, in just the Bible or in just、uh, any people's. That this is my point. Okay. So、uh, you said that we shouldn't use our bias to prove that something is right because we think it's right. But then everyone. Inherently has a bias. We we all we all came here to argue for a point that we might think is correct, and we will and we will definitely try to support our、um, argument with our bias. And actually,、uh, if you look hard enough, you can find evidence to any like random theory that you might have, and. You could just see the things that you want to see and ignore all the rest, but then、uh, that's not how science works. It's 
in evolution, we discovered a lot. Um, in evolution, the scientists discovered a lot of evidence that proves evolution correct and not only just using a book called the Bible. So there is a common ancestor of a human and ape that was found called the Aceli, and we know because it consisted of um, parts of apes and humans. So that's like the fossil that was found. Okay, are you happy with the answer? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question again? I'm sorry. Uh, Grace, could you repeat? Oh, sorry. So he said, um, um, that I didn't give like a evidence or something, but there is a common ancestor, and it's it was like that consisted of human and ape, and it was called a Sally. A Sally. Other challenges. Okay, Diane. So um, I want to ask Jackie. Uh, yes, you said that um, ugliness is like a tra um, a trait that is like not favorable in the society, but like and like it's doesn't matter if you're ugly or not, you can still find a partner. But then people. <laughs> Um, actually, people, like humans, have this instinct to find a partner based on their immune system, so then that's like a natural instinct, so then their kids could have a better mix. Because like, people want to find partners with like a different immune system than them, like a more diverse, so to diversify their offsprings. So then it's actually not about the prettiness and ugliness, it's more about the immune system and like about because if you have different immune system you have different smell so then some people might find like people find partners not because of their appearance but because of like their that's like natural instinct because of their smell and immune system so i want to ask you is it really about the prettiness and ugliness Okay, once again, I'm Timmy, and I want to challenge the TGS statement. You are said that the birds are involved from the archaeotherics, and do you have more convincible evidence? Because so far, we have, on the earth, we have found the six archaeotherics fossils, and five of, five of them are, uh, is already to confirm to be fake. And the last one refused to do any identification. So the fake, because they say that they are they, they are just from the fragment. They don't have a com completely fast source uh, now. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, so there is actually evidence. <laughs> there is actually evidence. You can take the most famous um, incomplete skeleton called Lucy, and then she was discovered 45 years ago in East Africa. And then she had, as you know, um, apes and humans are only one to two percent difference, right? So if you look at her, um, her neck joined farther toward the back of her skull and her brain was smaller than humans, but her ankles were flexible like human, humans, so it gave her human-like stride. So, and then she, her spine curved inward, and that is only found in humans, and, that, and no other hominid ancestor. So as time went by, apes had denser bones, like it, and it was stronger, and then as they evolved into humans, humans' um, bones became less dense. So there is evidence to show that you evolve, humans have evolved from apes. So that is a really, that is proven true. It's not proven fake.
Uh, okay, I'm I'm gonna to answer your question. And I I say the the prettiest or a handsome or ugly one. And uh, it was just an example, but that that didn't my my opinion. Uh, maybe I have a a bad example, but I just want I just want to say uh. We can we cannot see the structure of fossils to define it is a it, it, they are the same species or not. So, uh, and yeah, the other hand is uh, if you if we just see the fossils gene, because uh, sorry uh, let me think about it. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> uh, I think uh, all the species have the high similarity of the gene, and we can only see some part of the gene and uh, the structure of the fossil. So we cannot just use them to say they are the same species or not. That's my answer. Thank you. Yes. And so you found the fos fossil of the ancestor, but we can also say it because they fit to the environment, just like you say, the natural selection. And they, the, species, the species is suitable for the environment, so, but they are not the same species because they, just because they super di super similar, but they are not the same species and they, they, they involve in the and they variance in the same species and uh, they gradually involved, uh, not involved, they uh, variance <laughs> to be a human cat or a bird, but they are not the same species. And you, you, need, to, you need to prove that the species will, will involve to the different species. Uh, this is my opinion, thank you. So this is actually not a challenge to a direct speaker or not, it's a challenge to the whole, whole argument of creationism. So a lot of you guys talk about fragments and fossil records, or incompleteness of fossil records. However, I have something, I have an example to state for you that your statement is not valid. So I remember in the 1900s in chemistry, there are a lot of fragments in the, in the periodic table. However, when Dmitry Mendeleev first created the periodic table, there are many elements that's not being found, and they are known as fragments. And these fragments or unfounded elements does not mean that they did not exist. They just haven't found it yet. But as long as they found it, then they'll put in the fragments and put in the pieces of puzzle together, and they form the periodic table that how we see these now. So basically, what I'm, what I'm actually trying to say is that something's fragmented doesn't mean that it's not true. There's a possibility for it to be true, and this is being backed up by the example of a periodic table. Thank you. You said the fossil is not, it's not been found, but if you not found the fossil, you cannot say this is a truth. It's, you can, you can also, you can just say it's a story. It's a story that can answer the scientific question, scientific question, but it's not the truth, it's just a story. Okay, so basically, <laughs> basically what you say about fossils being a story, then I have a question for you. How about what the creationists, you guys believe in the Bible? It's also a story. It's a story that, a story that's not necessarily being proven to be true or have any evidence that it's, that it's existence. So, as you say that my fossil records are just a story that did not tell the truth, then how do you explain the existence or the accuracy of the Bible? Like, the Bible is what you creationists believe and build its standards on, creationism. 
So if you cannot explain the Bible existence or its accuracy, then how can you say that the fossil story is not accurate? We are not believe the creation. But today we just talked about the evolution is fact or fiction. So we just find some evidence to improve or to prove the uh, the evolution is fiction. We are now to believe the creation. Yeah. Final, final statement and uh, we, we need to uh, you guys said that you don't believe in creation, but your first speaker, I forgot who, but your first speaker, with, in the beginning of the speech, she already brought the example from the Bible to support her evidence. So if that is not supporting creation, then I don't know what is. No, oh, second speaker, sorry. Do you have a response? There you go. Just like before, I I use the Bible to put to uh to uh to to uh, to support my point is just uh, I say in a history in a long history we can't if our scientists we can't just uh want what is what I want so I believe this is true <coughs> so the Bible point say that and uh I I I know uh, some people will say uh the the Bible can this is it, is is uh it's not true. But how can know we he's not true or he is true? Yes, this is I want to say, and I, uh, I, I, I'm not to tell you the the Bible tell you this, so y you need to trust this. Okay. <laughs> All right, so thank you everyone who participated in this debate. It has been exciting for me to just sit there in silence and try to like think my own thoughts through about each team. I think everyone did a great job. I think that you guys were challenged with their opinions. Hopefully we provided a challenge as well. I was surprised by uh, certain sides of people that came out when they were behind this podium, which was good. Um, but my hope for you ultimately is that you find the truth to this question. Whatever the real answer is, I hope you find it. And I hope that you've been given lots of things to think about and not just shove in the back of your brain or forget about. I hope you continue these conversations as you keep going through college, as you guys hopefully go to college, um, <laughs> and I prepare you well. <laughs> uh, I think you will. But I'm hoping that these conversations continue and that it establishes you more as an individual. So thank you once again, everyone, Dr. Liu, for this opportunity. OK, I want to thank Ms. Cherry and for supporting this, uh, this program. I think everybody has benefit, uh, benefit, uh, benefited from, from this, uh, these activities. And uh, I'm really impressed with uh, each one of you. And I think the question is really, what is the truth? And as a scientist, 
if we find the theory has holes that facts don't support, when we need to look for alternative. For example, here we're not debating about creationism, we're debating of the theory of e evolution, whether it is a fact or a fiction. If in your heart, honestly, you don't find enough evidence to support the theory of evolution, you need to explore the alternative, which is a, a intelligent God that created. And I think you'll find it perhaps intellectually, it is more satisfying. But that has to do with also leap of faith. In both sides, it's a leap of faith. Okay, so I encourage each one to seek truth.